on healthcare entrepreneurship here. And why don't we introduce the newest members of the panel, right? Let's do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, John and Dr. Liu. Uh, it's, always, it's always a pleasure to uh, network with just a lot of great people. Uh, my name is Lawrence Jones, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Uh, uh, I've been in the Hopkins ecosystem for, for a while, and I'm currently a, a consultant for real estate biotech companies within the Baltimore, D.C. area. It's my, my own uh, private firm. I'm still here. <laughs> but by the way, I do, for those of you who didn't catch it earlier, so I teach in the Biotech Entrepreneurship and Enterprise uh, enterprise and Entrepreneurship Program here at Hopkins. So I put a plug, plug, plug in, so please Tell do. Tell the two classes you teach. So, and I teach uh, tech, technology transfer and commercialization, as well as ethical, legal, and regulatory aspects of the biotechnology enterprise. I can teach some courses as well. Uh, I'm Safia Edumalai, I'm uh, founder and CEO of a uh, medical device, a uh, digital health company called ADAR Health. Uh, it's actually a Johns Hopkins spun out, and uh, like uh, other members of the panel, I spent maybe 15 years in the Hopkins ecosystem, started as a student, and then um, like went back, worked, and came back again as a student, spent some time in the sky. And Where did you meet the entrepreneur? <coughs> I think uh, you can take the credit because uh, <laughs> uh, actually uh, one of my, my co-founder actually came and presented in his class looking for somebody to help him out. Uh, so I started as an advisor to the company and then essentially the company needed a CEO and not an advisor. So I, I left my awesome life and then started working <laughs> as a startup entrepreneur. For it's been almost like four, four and a half, five years, and the whole credit goes to him. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I didn't, get any, I didn't get any shares. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to take part in the suffering as well, right now. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, um, it's just actually a medical device company. It started as the device, but then now we are getting into the space as uh, as digital therapeutics. Um, what we built part of our company, it's a, it's a single device that measures more than 10 vital health parameters in just 30 seconds, non-invasively. Uh, essentially for managing and monitoring chronic disease patients at home, but now we are getting into the pharma space as well in terms of digital therapeutics, how we can use our device and our AI and machine learning back in to help with um, managing heart failure and COPD patients to start off with. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships going on right now, working with uh, around eight or nine pharma companies, uh, and also uh, talking to several peers. But uh, we're still a few months away from actually commercially launching. Uh, still in the struggle board, but uh, it's very rewarding. So uh, what's really interesting about the Hopkins ecosystem, and this is actually very interesting, um, there are a lot of, um, doctors and professors and faculty engineers that just don't have time to run with their technology. Mm -hmm. And so they need to find somebody who can communicate their story and run around and go to these pitch contests. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're an amazing person to do that. I mean, uh, did you win a couple of pitches, right? Yeah, we won like maybe 20, 30 awards. So you won about like 20 or 30 awards for this piece of technology that an entrepreneur at Hopkins had. I don't think the entrepreneur, I mean the engineer at Hopkins had, I don't think the engineer had the bandwidth nor the desire to take it to that level, right? So what's what's interesting is you gotta understand what you bring to the table and what you're missing. So you know this professor was actually very, very understanding, self-aware, that he did not want to go out to all these pitch contests and go do this stuff. He just wanted to teach and do continue to do his research. So he was looking for a CEO. He came over to the business school and he just started presenting in the class, right? And of course, we have so many business school students, they, don't nothing, they have nothing better to do, right? <laughs> they go get a piece of technology from Johns Hopkins and go pitch it, right? And so I think what you have to understand about this whole ecosystem is it's great. There's a lot of talented people on both sides, right? On the technical side, but also on the ability to communicate, and they have a lot of energy to go out there to these contests. Where did you go? Up and down the East Coast, or where? Uh, where did you go? All around the world. 
they went around the whole world pitching with these contests, right? And so if you don't have the technology, think about which you know, professor you can approach or engineer you can approach, right? And say, hey, look, I think I can run a business out of it. Of course, incentivize them and give them some upside, right? But now, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, that makes Hopkins great. And all we have to do is connect the dots, right? And the other thing is that, you know, um, if you do find uh, people looking for something to do, you know, just help them sort of connect the other side. Because it's really hard for somebody to have both sides, right? The technical side and also the contacts to the investors and understand how to tell the story to the investors, right? So there's, there's always this really um, nice, the yin and the yang, I call it the yin and the yang, right? You need both sides. And not one person has, usually, not, there's a few entrepreneurs or uh, professor doctors that are really good on both sides. But by and large, you know, this ecosystem is packed full of really, really good IP. You just need to sort of put it together. All right. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that, that, that's very well said, and I think the big problem that we have here is, is trying to unleash and unlock all of these great brains and these great technologies. The, I think the issue is that Hopkins is the best in the world at what it does, but it kind of only knows how to do one thing or a couple of things. Interface with government, heavy, heavy research, everything's MD, PhD, peer review, craziness, but then Hey, how do I raise money? Uh, you know, hey, how do I sell the market? Uh, you know, and so the question becomes from someone that is great at sales and marketing or great at building companies, how do I understand which piece of technology or which medicine or which drug or which therapy is the right one? How can I make sense of that? The, the technical people, it's no different than the people in Silicon Valley that make their, their, their pet project. It could be silicon, it could be anything you know, chips, whatever. You may love it, but it may not sell. It may be the best way to do something like Betamax, but it may not be the best thing for the market. So we have to, I think in, in Hopkins, we have a tremendous translational problem between the great brains with the science and the people that can actually run with that. And if we're almost on this island here. You know, we're away from Boston and that whole scene. We're away from the Valley and that whole scene. We kind of just talk to ourselves and government, and that's the challenge. So how do we fix that? Sorry, I just took the mic. Like, it was mine. So, but um, you know what, when you, when John, when you raised the issue before about, you know, why is it that we have, uh, you know, so few deals done here, and, you know, the, the investment isn't where, where we would like it to be and certainly not comparable, you know, to what goes on in California uh, or the Boston area. You know, one of the one of the things that is, it's, it's good, it's bad, it's a double-edged sword here is that we're so close to government. We have so many close government relationships and I've dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, in the, in the medical space, in the biotech space, who when you say, you know, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to get my next government grant. Right. And, and it's a mentality issue because it's like, oh, well, I'm going to get this, and then I'm going to try to get this SBIR, and then, well, then I can get a bigger, if I do that, I'll qualify for an even bigger SBIR. Um, and I'm like, do you, do you ever think about, like, I don't know, making it, like, profitable? Um, and so we can do, you know, we can write a business plan, and work, maybe not, but I mean, yeah, um, you know, we can do things and get a little bit of a, you know, interest in the marketplace, you know, the marketplace, that's those people out there who might want to buy your stuff one day, um, instead of just continuously funding it from now until eternity at this, like, really sad little level. And so, so one of the problems that we have is this government, everything's about the government mentality. And the, the second aspect is that we, you're absolutely right, we have some of the most brilliant minds. No, I just wanted to put one little thing in there. If there is an idea about, hey, let's take this private, it's always through the huge drug companies, Pfizer, Genentech, this kind of thing. So well, there, there's no like, let's start a company, let's get it to the middle market here, let's run fast. Well, and the other, well, and part of it is, I, we want to take it to the big drug companies, we want to take it to the, to the real big manufacturers, I'd be willing to give them 3% for $100 million. Um, that's not going to happen. You know, you can't maintain control of your company and get $100 million from no artist. That's just not going to happen. Sure. And, and so, so that's a, a, a huge problem that we have, and I think that's the other thing. We have to have all the equity. We don't want to actually look at the business 
aspect of it. So the biggest challenge that I have as a practitioner in this area is to try to get, quite frankly, people who start off as, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to offend the docs in the room, but you know, when you have super smart people, they want to just maintain control of everything, like the white knuckles, you know, they just like dig in. And my job is kind of to try to start to peel their fingers away and smack them down and say, no, you're going to be the CSO and go away because I'll be interim CEO until we can get this baby off the ground. The resistance to actual success is stunning. Those, those are some excellent points. Uh, I actually have, uh, I've actually been in business since May of 2019 and unfortunately I've already, I already have clients. I have one international client and uh, oh, thank you. And one of my the client uh, uh, preferably wants the land of Boston or of Silicon Valley. And I, I was trying to think, well, why not Maryland? Right. Because Maryland is really pushing a lot of the tax credits. And so what I just found out recently is that, yes, there's a lot of money here, but uh, Maryland's very risk averse. Yes. Uh, a lot of the money is invested right, right, in uh, real estate, things that you can kind of see the trend. As we know, Boston often has the alumni of the, like the Facebooks and the other types of companies that kind of broke the mold. So there are, I'll just make the quick comment. Uh, I mentioned to, uh, to someone, physician, entrepreneur, and I mentioned Boston, and immediately, I would say within 15 minutes, I had about four or five people uh, who were like venture people investing from Boston. They were excited. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, come on up here. And it's like, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maryland is like, oh, let's, uh, let's think about this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I do think, as we pointed out, I think uh, oh, sure. pointed out, there is just a, there's a culture yeah. uh, that's been embedded. I don't think that there's, it's not that there's no funds. I just think there, I, I think what's gonna to have to happen is that we have to have the continual success, some wins, to then, you know, get the cash flow going. No, I, I completely agree with you because uh, at least from the first hand experience, I, I ran, went around the country, spoke to different investors, uh, I raised two and a half million for my company, but not even a single dollar came from America. Uh, none of the American investors, I, I went to all the angels, I, I spoke to different people. They Where's were the best place to raise money? Yeah, I would say Silicon Valley and Boston. Yeah, 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 two other places. And, and, and for me, the biggest challenge was I spoke to pretty much every, every investor here, like angel investors. They would rather invest in a food truck than a life-saving yeah. device or drug, right? That was a really frustrating part and I think even for me to, I just kind of gave up on Baltimore and decided to leave. Uh, we in, even today, like if I go to Boston, like with overflowing companies there in Boston, people still do everything to bring new companies. Like there's no space in Boston for them. Um, the MEHI, like Massachusetts e Health Initiative, is one of the places where they can still contact me to like, hey, there is all the different <laughs> opportunities available. Come here. Where Maryland is still struggling, right? I'm presented to everybody. The, the only challenge is, hey, if we have to do anything with the FDA, they drop it and say, okay, come back to us. Okay. Uh, if they don't, they don't like the term FDA, although we are like, really close to FDA. Uh, and doctors, again, like, like we don't, you don't get any value. It's a Johns Hopkins spun out, but if you go to a doctor, they're like, hey, uh, come back after an FDA submission, or I'm not the right person for you to talk to. So we, we had all these different challenges, and, and from a business school perspective, I think uh, students really wanted to graduate out, get that big buck, like big money, like nobody's really interested in like, like sacrificing maybe one or two years of their life to make a big impact, right? For me, it was, it was a personal need, so I decided to give up what I was doing. But nine out of 10 students really wanted to go get a bigger, uh, Salary job. So I think that's something that you got to do something about it in terms of inspiring the next generation. Is. I think that's all right. I mean, we absolutely have to have the wins. I talked to the dean about that. We talked to Professor Liu about that. 
and, and there's a great book, and I keep harping on it every now. We'll continue to harp on it. It's called uh, Regional Advantage by uh, Annalise Sexton, and she's a dean over at Berkeley. It compares Route 128 with Silicon Valley, and how Silicon Valley overtook Route 128 was because of the culture. If you're uh, an engineer at AMD, and I'm an engineer at Intel, we can sit down, and have a drink after after work, work on our stuff, whatever like that. And again, the corporate lawyers may not be so happy about that, but it spurs this kind of ingenuity and that place is literally 24 7 work all the time i'm not saying that's the best of things but that's just kind of how it how it is and there's this we can do anything and let's do it first and figure out how it all makes sense later mentality as opposed to this weight and diligence here one of the other things about these deals that i think that we need to talk about i mean we all kind of know it but but i think for you know for everyone else to to bring up the speed is the difference between this deal and like a Facebook, Facebook can be funded and go public in three years. These deals are 10 year deals, 12 year deals, billion dollar deals. You could throw 10, 30 million in, in other companies, you know, and go public. So that's part of the challenge. I mean, so that's another huge barrier, and huge bar. Do we need to focus on one-offs or ways we can play health, ways we can play Hopkins without going through the traditional, you know, 10-year billion dollar financings because we kind of know how to do some of that. There's still a lot of help that needs to be there, but are there other opportunities we can take advantage of? Oh, well, I was going to say that I, just in terms of thinking about the the, uh, the high net worth uh, people. I mean, I would even go as far as looking, you know, going to uh, <laughs> entertainers or athletes, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, for example, the athletes could be, you know, sports medicine, those types of things. Uh, and so, just in general, I just think we have to look at other, not the always going down the road to the government. Right, and well, no, I totally agree. I mean, you know, government is not going to be the answer to actually getting companies off the ground. It never has been, it never will be. Sorry, but that's the way it goes. No, like, like, nobody's here from, like, Tedco or one of those companies, right? So, I buy them. So, <laughs> I love that. Um, now I can speak freely. Um, so, you know, one of the other things is, you know, we, it's, it, we don't lack for people who are, you know, we don't want for entrepreneurial minds. We have a lot of people who have a lot of brilliant, amazing ideas. Um, I've been very blessed to have worked with some of them. Um, but you know what happens when an entrepreneur, um, let's say that you're a faculty member at Hopkins or you're somewhere else, um, an entrepreneur says, I'd really love to form a company with this, what do I do? And then somebody, like, comes out of some dark corner um, go, go talk to Ted Co. Um, right. Or go talk to you know the MD yeah, Tech right. Council. Right. Right. So and they have a deal for you. Their deal for you. We can invest up to like a hundred thousand dollars at the end of three years. We just want triple our money back. Uh, you know what? Tony Soprano will give you a better deal than three hundred percent. Um, you know, on, on a developmental timeline that's 10 years until you hit your IMD. So, so that's not like re like remotely in the universe that we need to be in. So part of it is that we need to have a, a way of advising entrepreneurs, like people who are inventor, either inventor or technical entrepreneurs, um, that, that, that kind of over just you know, don't go running and telling those people that I said that, but don't go to Tedco. You know, put it on your credit card, ask your grandmother, do something, but don't do that. Um, and then, okay. No, 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 I was gonna say, uh, let me just see something up and I'll, I'll turn right over to stop it. My point is, and again, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to be negative. My point is, is to try to look for solutions. So I think that we need to have some people sit down, people like Professor Liu, the deans, great entrepreneurs, stuff like that, have, who have had some success and say, okay, well, we think, this, you know, almost like saying, hey, we're gonna be a STEM university now. We think these kinds of deals are probably gonna be a little bit easier traction. We're gonna look for the deals we can get two, three, four years and start getting things, then partner up with the Berkeley's, the, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley's, the, you know, the Polaris Fund, stuff like that, in order to get some wins. Once we have some wins and we have a story, now we're off to the races. Well, I think that, in, in that, I'm sorry, I just jumped right um, 
So part of that is, you know, is having an openness to investor initiated right. It, um, right. development. Right. Uh, because there are a lot of investors, I deal with them, I'm talking to somebody right now. Hey, do you know anybody over at Hopkins? He's not in this area. Um, you know, who has some interesting technology or something that we can look at in this XYZ space. And, and my thought is, this is fabulous. Because the, the, this puts the money and the, you know, and the interest together before we, you know, just try to find some guy who's willing to take whatever he's done in his lab and put it in his garage. That was the other thing I was doing. We talked about that too. Maybe we don't, maybe we're not the place to start everything up. Maybe what we do is powered by Hopkins. We're the consultants. We're, we can take deals over here and do the incubation. We talked about that. Absolutely. All right, so for the record, <laughs> for the record, everyone, pay attention. You too. <laughs> Lamar Jackson has an open invitation to come here anytime. <laughs> and why? Because he's exciting, right? And they're like, literally, I'm sure somebody in our ecosystem knows, right? And well, you know, he's young, he's exciting. I think what we should do for this ecosystem is get very dynamic people like that. Sure. Right? Mix them in, and then it's gonna draw, you know, maybe some student athletes from Hopkins. Okay, that's fine. Maybe they have ideas. But we gotta make it exciting here. Yeah. And then the money will come, right? Yeah, there's VCs here, they don't really do much. And I had the same experience. I was trying to when I first got here, I ran around all the fast forwards. There's one guy, John Sweeney, who started all of this. And I was like, John, you have so much tech, you should start businesses over here. He's like, yeah, 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 I talked to this person, this person, and this person, and, and some of those organizations that you mentioned, but I don't want to bash them, right? So th these people, and nothing happened. But I had a lot of meetings. I wasted a lot of time, and my Rolodex was packed full of lots of people. This is not And then, and then I went down to D.C., and then, boom, my business was just popping. You just can feel it, right? And you go to New York, you get the same thing. So it's not surprising, you know, what happened where he goes outside. Remember, John's Hopkins technology, the brand is globally explosive. And you go up to New York, or you go up to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, right, it's just really exciting with some of this stuff. So I, what we have to think about is the brand outside of Baltimore, mm -hmm. and maybe we start with receiving the getting the capital outside of Baltimore, right? It's a great brand. That, we just need the model. Right. We need the model, but we also need to like encourage the excitement. Right, right, right. right. There also has to be a user-friendly way of. Yeah, I and I and I'll. A long time ago, I used to be in the office of tech licensing here at Hopkins for School of Medicine, and we were told behind the scenes. We only want to license out to the big boys. And so it cut out right. entrepreneurs. Right. Entrepreneurship dies when you're only interested in licensing product X to Merck or to Novartis. And there's nothing wrong with those places. And don't get me wrong, if I had something that was in my docket that was suitable for them, that's fabulous. But we have a, we had a lot of entrepreneurial people and they fought tooth and nail. Um, and to no, we can't do it. I, you know, that, and that has fluctuated over the years. Some years you have more, um, you know, a little bit more friendliness toward entrepreneurs, and other years you just don't. And it, it kind of changes with the administration within that office. Sorry, can you give the cardiology example of? I, I had a cardiologist who, guy. Who, well, this is a long time ago. So no, you probably don't know. Him. Um, you know, he had a tech, the combination product it was great. He was having getting a lot of grief because he wanted to start his own company. Um, after he left and I left, we got together and I got his company away from him and even got a federal release so that there were no more federal strings on his technology. And and he made a half a billion on an option. Uh, so, you know, that's, wow. things can happen if we stop. You know, sometimes, even though Hopkins is one of the biggest and the best in the world, sometimes we come into this Maryland kind of mental process, which is like, look at Maryland, we're really small, we think small too, and you should too. So. <laughs> I, I really have a solution, but I need people to help me out with that, all right? Uh, the best thing is, from, in our company, there's at least five or six physicians who are investors, right? There are hundreds of physicians at Hopkins, and everybody has money, and, and the only challenge is physicians don't know what to invest in, where to invest in, right? Why don't we freaking create uh, a, like a 
angel group, yeah. right? Yeah. Somebody who can just map me there. Yeah. Angel MD is there again, yeah. uh, but um, basically somebody that is Maryland based, get all, like, I mean, somebody like him, no, right? Like somebody it. who can just. John and I, we can do right, it. I love it. Yeah. Somebody who can create this entity. I mean, I'll be happy to contribute as an entrepreneur, like, I can wet the companies, I can do everything because uh, unfortunately I'm part of Baltimore, right? So I can really help everybody out, but there should be somebody who's reliable that physicians can trust, physicians can say, hey, I have like $10,000. I got a guy, I mean, from DC who called me and said, I love your technology, I want to invest like $10,000. That's how, how I can invest, but I'm ready to be an advisor. I can help you out with everything possible. So why don't we do such, such a no. thing? And that's a and that's a great point. I, I just I just recently joined. Uh, I was invited to join the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have to be a physician, but yes, yeah, 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 And uh, but uh, they want to start a chapter here. So uh, in terms of physicians starting the chapter, based to your point, I'm just making a comment. So uh, it was started here actually. Oh, had it. The founder was. Uh, uh, Hopkins guy, he started this, but that's what I'm saying. Like, and then, but then most of the investment goes to outside. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, I was uh, the founder. I was in contact with was uh, Arlen and uh, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I, I would just want to piggyback on what you commented about. So, I was just recently at, uh, just last week, uh, a company Benavir. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the news, mm -hmm. and I mean they start off very small. Uh, they were acquired by uh, J and J, but their their subsidiary, uh, Janssen, uh picked them up. But there was a small company, husband and wife team, about ten employees, and they were uh, as of a year ago they were bought out for one point two billion. And I, I I had to give them a slow clap because <laughs> I was just we were just like amazed that. Uh, but again, they were small, but uh, just, just one little thing about that. So I think the thing that we always have to be very mindful about entrepreneurship, I know entrepreneurship always sounds really, you know, nice and, you know, and kind of a, you know, classic kind of thing, but it's it's really a, a really a, a grimy, oh my gosh. grimy business. So the, 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 the uh, CEO, well, the founder mentioned, he said, it took about four years to kind of constantly go back and forth with that company, but they really didn't want to be bothered. And so to your point, it's not just, okay, we did some, you know, maybe positions and other, you know, people, mm -hmm. but I think there also has to be the understanding. It's not going to just happen overnight. Yeah, so Sukat is a husband and wife team with about 10 employees. What's so fun about entrepreneurship, I'll tell you, like, if you want excitement in your life, like, you know, remember when we were like younger, right? And there were kind of like boring careers, right? You could go choose a boring career, or you could choose a career that you could have a heart attack, you might live, you might die, <laughs> right? You might find kids that you don't you know, know about, right? Like the next day, right? And or someone's trying to steal your business away from you. <laughs> so, like, what's so fun about the entrepreneurial journey it's, first of all, it's very challenging, but like as you mentioned, right, it's very, very difficult. It's just like gut-wrenching sometimes. And you wake up and you're like, why am I doing this? It's so difficult. I should just get a job on Wall Street again or something like that. But at the other times, you're like, I love this job. It's awesome. But what's really exciting about like the entrepreneurial journey is you got to start small. Just start something. And start something with people that, you know, are, that easily you trust. You don't even know which way it's going to go. Because you may, or that person may have a contact that opens one amazing door for you guys, right? And you never really know where it's going to come from. And you can try to plan it all day long. You know, we go to these conferences and we talk to these people and we're going to get money from this. And all of a sudden it comes from one of your relatives that you haven't spoke to in a long time, right? So that's what's so exciting about it. You, you plan as much as you think you're going to plan. But the opportunity comes some other place. But I, but I encourage everyone to start their own small business, you know, themselves, so they can see, you know, what it's like, and just keep it going, right? And you have to celebrate everything. As soon as you get your LLC up and running, you celebrate that. You go over to what is that place right next door? Our, our house. Our house. Yeah, that's a good bar, right? 
Oh, oh, this way. So, <laughs> our house. And then when you hire your first employee, when you make your first sale, when you make your first $10,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars, tell me, you gotta celebrate everything yeah. along the way. Because it, it goes by, you know, pretty fast. But there's also like the drama and the sad part of you're gonna have to let go of people. You have to like fire people who are not working out, right? And that's also, you know, emotionally stressful, right? But this is the kind of journey that, you know, I think people should do. I think, especially, you know, doctors and professors, they should always have their little side business on the side. Because, like, they, we need so many people, right? Just being a professor, Chris is here. How many people? Chris has this business that he'll talk about later. But I'll, I'll, I'll uh, it's two, two quick points, I think Heather has some questions, maybe a couple questions, and we'll get to the next panel. Here's how you do it. You have a couple of different models, and I think you're right. I love that idea. But it's being done sort of now with Andrew MD. The problem that I have with that model is we trust the physicians to tell us what to invest in. Now, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, are you out of your mind? Like, that's nuts. I mean, or the other model is alumni ventures, and that's working pretty well. But the problem there is we're only taking Hopkins deal. We already have a problem here. What I would say what you do is you need to have people that really understand the fun world. You have the doctors as your LPs. Maybe some other people. Now you use the doctors as your technical advisors. Okay, you come in do due diligence. I think that's how you play it. And we have to understand, but the problem is with the, with the physicians is, like the lawyers, sometimes the ego gets the best of you. And if we look at most physicians' offices, they're maybe not run so well. That's why so many of them are running to get an MBA. I've had physician friends of mine like, if I don't get an MBA, I'm gonna go out of business. Same thing with the lawyers. So you have to understand where the water's edge is and what you're good at and how you build that team and how you can deploy your money. The other thing is you said, Dr. Lou, is look, I'm a physician, I'm making half a mil, I'm making a mil, I'm making a couple mil. Do I really want to go and, and make $10,000 next year in my first startup? Am I ready to bungee jump that or am I ready to leave big law and do that? When I, when I left Wilson and I joined Gill, I got a huge pay bump. When I left Gill and I did my own thing, I tripled my money. So here I am, you know, not even 30, making half a mil in Silicon Valley 20 years ago. That was a lot of money. I was way ahead of my peers. But then there were years where, you know, then I look back, I'm like, oh, jeez, if I would've, should've, could've stayed here, you know, I think, you know, I'm looking around, like, I'm a loser, you know, whatever. And so I've been here, I've been here, you know what I mean? It's high beta. And so some years I'm killing it, some years it's killing me. So that's a risk that you have to be willing to take, and nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you, that that's what it is. We have all this glorification, Gary V, all the rest, Shark Tank, all the winners. But most people are losers. And I think it was in, in your class, right? I mean, 90, 95% of all funded deals, funded deals, go BK or don't work. So we have to be honest about that and about what it is. And then the last thing I'll say is on the last one we did in DC, there was, and I won't name the names, but there was a little bit of a disagreement about whether you have to risk it, whether you can do the side hustle and really make the moonshot off that. And I'm here to tell you there's no way that's gonna work. It, you may hit the lottery ticket, you may get, you know, maybe someone will make you an advisor because they love you and here's a bunch of shares, whatever like that, but if you really are gonna do your own thing, you gotta go all in. And our professionals that have $100,000, $300,000 worth of med school loans, law school loans, willing to do that when they've got a pretty nice job. That's another part of the challenge that we have, I think, here. And I think other people have some questions. Heather, Heather you. Uh, so I, I can't resist commenting. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I just have to concur with what you're saying. The, the, the chief characteristics I would describe are people that can take a lot of punishment <laughs> and have the resilience and the grit to, to see it through and get back up, get some more punishment, get back up again have some public humiliation, have some public failures, get back up, do it again, and again, and one more time. And that, that is not talking about enough the psychological burden that entrepreneurs experience, but that's not even what I was raising my hand about. I just going to help them. Uh, the thing I wanted to say, listening to the discussion about the, the local economy, the regional dynamics, the comments about Maryland being small, stay small, <laughs> that was hysterical. Uh, it comes to a community that I'm sort of informally a part of because they were so inclusive and welcoming me is around Austin, Texas. Yeah. And, and I feel like listening to this conversation that there is uh, all the raw materials of what has been created in Austin, Texas are right here in Baltimore. Yeah. So inside the Dell Medical School, there is a funded blockchain healthcare incubator. Part of the deal 
of being in that incubator is access to, to data, to infrastructure, to, to the ability to pilot and experiment under, under what they create effectively as a regulatory sandbox. There are, there's also the Austin Blockchain Collective that is formed that is a nonprofit of, of a, a wide range of just a totally thriving community that is there in large part because of the, the Dell Medical School incubator. And then the Susan and Michael Dell Foundation brings in, brings in the bigs, you know, and such that, that they provide a, um, a broad vehicle for access to large scale transactions and the ability to validate. And it's all, it's all right here, and it's a great template that could be examined. And, and to speak to that, I'm actually from Texas. I, got, I still got I've worked in Austin. That medical school is brand new. They have just like microwaved that whole thing. So they are immediately like really getting traction on that. And that shows just, it doesn't take long if you have the right people involved, the right mentality. No, I think it, it's brand new, and it was formed with the purpose of transforming healthcare. That's the stated objective, is change and transformation. I think the biggest problem here is uh, there's only a handful of people who call themselves experts, and then they are often go, I mean, everybody go back to them. Like, I mean, if you go to Texas uh, or Tedco, <laughs> there's like three or four people who are part of Angel and or like um, Baltimore Angels. And then they're also part of Hopkins, or they're part of like all these different same people. If you don't like them, if this person does not like you, you're not going to get money from anywhere else. That's right? problem. That's and, exactly. and, and you go, there's, there's only one person that is, that, that is always considered. And if I go, oftentimes I'm not part of any of these like events in Baltimore because of the fact that like, you get to go meet the same person who always in the panel and always call himself the expert and on always rejecting companies <laughs> because he is supporting his own company. I feel that is what like making people run away from here. So there should be a system in place where more people come in like, and more people are part of this solution. More people wanted to help companies instead of just having one set of people doing the same thing. I think that's where the bigger challenge is. Super quick wrap up, we have to get to the next panel. I'm trying to hold off to the next panel because I wanted Katie to be here to see Dr. Sagal <laughs> anyway. So it all worked out, if we can wrap up quickly. Okay, I'll wrap it real quick. But you know, one thing is you'd think that there was a giant wall um, between Montgomery County and Baltimore because it, a lot of times, you know, they deal with each other like they're going from, you know, one is on the moon and the other is Mars, you know, something. And we don't have this cohesive, you know, the, this entire region um, can, can be a center. Um, and the other thing I would just I would just add, kind of on a personal note about entrepreneurs, I think the biggest thing in terms of context of long-term success is the ability to be coachable. Yeah. Um, I have a number of colleagues who are in venture groups. Um, they're all psychologists because their test really for entrepreneurs is, are you willing to do the things, the hard things that need to be done? And that sometimes means letting go of the reins yourself to allow people who do have that knowledge, that specialized knowledge to help you be successful, to actually let go enough so that you can achieve that success and so the, the coachability and the, and the mentality of the entrepreneur is as, is as or more important than the subject matter of the, of the company that's being formed. Um, because you can have the cure for cancer, but if everybody's bickering and nobody wants to let go of any equity and, and you don't, don't do the things that have to be done to make the business work as a business, you're never going to get off of you know, off the, the mark. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.